Welcome to another edition of Hey DT. Hey DT is a series of videos I do where I respond to viewer questions and comments. These viewer questions and comments, they typically come from the videos posted on YouTube and on Odyssey. Sometimes they come through other social media such as Mastodon or Reddit. Sometimes they come through email. And the very first question I want to respond to is, Hey DT, I'm really enjoying your new video man pages series. It's strange no other content creator has done this yet. By the way, how many commands in total do you plan to cover? So first off, thank you for the, your, the kind words that you say you're enjoying the series so far. I, I really appreciate that. Also, you mentioned that no other content creator has done something like this and you're kind of surprised. I was surprised by it too. That's kind of why I wanted to do something like this. I, I think it's a, a project that you know, is deserving to have as far as a video man pages kind of series. How many commands do I plan to have in total once I'm done with this? I don't know, probably more than a hundred. I think I could easily do videos on a hundred plus of the most popular shell utilities, GNU core utilities and things like that. It, it's going to be a substantial amount of videos in that series. Ideally though, as far as goals, like immediate goals of my Mine. I'm thinking that I would like to have about 50 of these videos done by the end of this year. That's kind of the goal I've set and get about 50 done this year. And then, you know, going forward, eventually push that number up to 100, maybe quite a bit higher than 100 at some point. Moving on to the next question. Hey, DT, you recommended that people start a YouTube channel, but do you also recommend starting podcast? And isn't AI going to outcompete human generated content? Excellent question. So yes, I have made videos in the past. I've talked about this that I think everyone should start a YouTube channel if they're interested in doing so. If it's something you've been thinking about doing, yeah, just do it. I think it's great. Everybody should be making content. Like if you want to write, for example, you want to write a book, you know, do some self-publishing of, you know, some things you want to put out there in the world, do it. If you want to make video content on platforms like YouTube, do it. If you want to do audio only podcasts, which you asked about, absolutely do it. And the reason I say do it is because every one of us, every single person on this planet has something that they can sell as far as knowledge that they have that they can sell to the world. And I say sell, it doesn't necessarily have to be like locked behind a paywall, but you know, if you're doing YouTube and you're getting ad revenue, or if you're doing audio podcast or whatever, you're probably going to have some corporate sponsors, but you know, you're going to have a way to monetize that knowledge that you have. And I think that's great. And you know, everyone knows some stuff that other people don't know. And you could actually turn that into content and you could earn a few bucks along the way. Now, the part where you ask about AI, is AI generated content eventually going to outcompete human generated content and put all of us out of business? I would say absolutely not. There are some things that AI does better than humans, but there's some things that humans do that AI just can't do. First of all, yes, there's a lot of AI generated spam on social media and on video platforms like YouTube because AI, you can't compete with AI in terms of its speed, its efficiency, uh, cost effectiveness, right? You can just automate a ton of spam and just throw it out there. But here's the thing. It's just automated spam and nobody really is interested in consuming that kind of content. You can spot the videos on YouTube that are auto generated spam, the AI generated spam. They're not very good. And the reason they're not very good is because they're created by a machine. A machine is not going to be able to create a video that has any kind of creativity or authenticity. It's not gonna be able to do any critical thinking the way a human being can do. It's not gonna be able to build trust with an audience the way I, you know, I've made probably 2000 videos on YouTube. I've built a trust with you guys that consume my content. We've built a relationship. AI is never going to be able to do any of that. So no, I don't think AI is ever going to outcompete humans when it comes to content creation. And the next question, hey DT, have you heard about a book called The Courage to Be Disliked? You might find it relatable. It's an uncommon and underrated skill to accept to not always be liked. And the awesome thing is that the people that do like you, they like you for the person you actually are. Happiness can't be more real than that. So uh, I know I've never actually heard of this book that you mentioned, and, and he's mentioning this because I made a video uh, a couple of weeks back, one of my backyard boomer vlogs, where I mentioned that, you know, I'm an honest person. I tend to tell the truth. I don't do a lot of bullshitting, right? And some people 
don't like me for that. You know, some people in life, especially fake people in life, they tend to hang out and like other fake people. They don't like real people, right? And, you know, and that's okay, you know, because that's not, that's not a me problem. That's a them problem, right? Now you wrote, happiness can't be more real than that. Talking about if other people like you, they really like you for who you are, not who they imagine you to be. And that's true happiness, right? Well, I'm not necessarily sure I buy into that. I think, you know, for human beings, there's a lot of things that are like the main causes of people being happy in life. And there's also some main causes of people being unhappy in life. When it comes to happiness, you know, some of the things that really, when you find somebody truly happy, it's usually because of their engagement in life. They love, for example, their job or whatever it is, their hobbies. They, they love the stuff they're doing in life, their activities, right? They're really engaged in life. And some people don't have that engagement. Those people typically are the ones that are not very happy. One of the biggest sources of happiness is just having a purpose in life. And that is really the key is find out what your purpose in life and then go do that thing. You know, be doing something that is meaningful. And that really is the secret. And also, naturally, you know, the things that everybody knows should make you happy, good relationships and good health. You know, focus on all of those areas and you'll be fine. Some of the things that will absolutely make you a very unhappy person, like there's four really main causes of unhappiness in humans. The very first one is spouse, right? Uh, did you pick the wrong partner, right? Because if you pick the wrong partner, you are not going to be very happy, right? Uh, the second uh, source of unhappiness, your education, you know, some people don't like uh, their schooling, uh, what they went to school for, their, their career path. And the third source of unhappiness is actually that career path, that job. And finally, the fourth source of unhappiness usually involves where you're at, your location, right? Where you're currently living. Many people hate where they live. Now, the good thing is the sources of unhappiness, you can pretty much change all of them. You don't have to keep the same spouse, the same education, the same job, or the same location, right? The thing is, when if you're an unhappy person, identify the cause of your unhappiness and change it. Next up, hey DT, is DTOS stable enough to install on physical hardware yet? I've been thinking about replacing my Arco Linux with DTOS. Are the drivers for NVIDIA graphics cards installed out of the box with this distro? Uh, I have no idea if DTOS is stable enough for you to install on physical hardware. I, I wouldn't recommend it because I haven't tested it on physical hardware because I haven't put it on my main machines because I'm, I've already got things set up. I don't want to do a fresh install on like my production workstation where I'm making this video. Video right now it, it, it takes some work to wipe things out reinstall everything make a lot of backups I haven't done that and I don't have any extra machines unfortunately I don't have like any test laptops that I could test DTOS on right now I'm very hardware poor as far as having like extra hardware I would love to have like some test equipment some test laptops especially to actually test DTOS I, I need that equipment I don't currently have it and I'm not in a position to go buy some of this equipment and I'm not sure that necessarily uh, there will be enough interest in DTOS for me to make that kind of purchase anyway. So right now, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend putting it on physical hardware unless it's a test machine of yours and you want to try it out. Go ahead. Next up is a comment from a video I did a couple of weeks back where I did a tier list ranking of all the web browsers that I've used over the years. And this person writes, hey DT, you clickbaited me with that thumbnail, putting Safari in the great tier and putting Brave in meh had me triggered. Nice job. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. A lot of people, I get a lot of comments every time I do one of those tier list kind of videos because I always do the clickbait thumbnail where I rearrange everything in the thumbnail as far as the tiers that I rank everything because I don't want it to be a spoiler. I don't want to just give you my final tier list in a thumbnail. You don't have to watch the video then. So I usually mix it up and cause some controversy. You know, like I had Microsoft Edge in the top tier category, right? And yeah, I had Safari, obviously, in the bottom tier where it belonged. And people at, uh, did ask me about Safari specifically. I, I was actually surprised how many people in the comments asked, hey, why do you hate on Safari so much? Doesn't everybody hate Safari? For one thing, it's a WebKit browser. So those browsers are typically the worst. Pretty much 
most of the WebKit stuff was in those like bottom two tiers. And then on top of that, it's proprietary software. It's not free and open source. On top of that, it's proprietary software that runs on like the Mac operating systems. I mean, where else was I going to put it other than that bottom tier? Moving on, yet another edition of Hey DT where I get questions about doom scrolling. You people really love defending your doom scrolling, but I'll try to keep this very brief. He writes, Hey DT, guess what? You don't get to decide whether people should be informed or not. While I don't enjoy doom scrolling, I do believe in social responsibility. Ignorance is what got us into this mess in the first place. So he's basically saying that the world is a mess, right? And it's ignorance that got us in this mess because people don't watch enough of news, I guess, right? Like people are not sitting around consuming mainstream media enough. That's why the world is a mess. That's, uh, I can't disagree more. One of the things that bothers me with these people that defend doom scrolling, they always make this assumption that the world is a mess, that the world is bad, not just bad. They kind of imply that the world is getting worse, like the world used to be better and now it's worse. And objectively, if you study this and I, I'm being dead serious, just sticking to facts, if you objectively do any research at all, the world is a better place now than it has ever been by any metric that you can actually go study. We're talking about things like poverty levels. We're talking about things like education, literacy. We're talking about people that, you know, have enough food to eat and health, right? disease, right? Pretty much anything that is something most people would consider like a legit metric as far as is the world better now than it was before. The, the world is as good as it's ever been, right? Like literally nobody can argue with that. The only people that argue with that are the people that are doom scrolling, right? Because they're consuming content that's constantly telling them the world is a terrible place. And I keep repeating this, just open your eyes, look at the world as it really exists, go out in the world, look at reality. I'm not seeing any of the things that I see when I watch mainstream media or uh, watch people argue on Twitter all day long, right? None of that actually exists in the world. Those people, they live in an imagination world, right? I'm actually out here in the real world. And again, if you objectively study any of this stuff, the world is not a mess, right? That's, you've been, you've been lied to and you just, you gotta get out of the doom scrolling guys. Next question. Hey, DT, I have a semi-ridiculous question. Well, I'll be the judge of that. He goes on to write, I know you mainly use Linux, but have you ever messed with FreeDOS? It's FOSS and it's licensed under GNU. I'm assuming when he says it's licensed under GNU, he's talking about the GNU GPL license. Well, no, I've never used FreeDOS. I don't think I ever will. I have no reason to. It's a license under a free and open source license. Great. But still, just because it's free and open source software, I don't use every piece of free and open source software. Uh, I only use the stuff that I have a use for, right? <laughs> FreeDOS, what's it used for? I, and I'm kind of asking facetiously. I know people use FreeDOS, uh, especially people that are boomers from an older generation that lived through the DOS years. And I did, right? I'm old enough that, yeah, I remember playing around with DOS back in the 1980s. But now I... I would have no use for it. I don't use any legacy DOS software, specifically uh, DOS games. It's a, what a lot of people use free DOS for. I'm not into that stuff anyway, so I've got no use for it. The only other real use for free DOS would be if I was developing DOS software, like modern day DOS software for whatever reason. I'm not doing that. Uh, other than that, I mean, some vendors, I, I know like some hardware manufacturers, like computer vendors, will ship FreeDOS as the operating system on a machine if they want to put an operating system on a machine, but they don't want to pay for like a Windows license, but they know they, they got to ship some OS on the operating system, so they'll just put FreeDOS on it because it's, it's free, both free as in freedom, also free as in cost in this case. But long story short, I just don't have a use for FreeDOS, so I doubt you'll ever see a video of me playing around with FreeDOS. I would wouldn't even know what to do with it. And the final question is, hey DT, is Emacs a text editor or is it an operating system? Well, that's the age old question, isn't it? Now, is Emacs just a text editor or is it really something more? And yes, Emacs is both a text editor and it's something more, right? So Emacs 
a lot of people just don't quite understand Emacs and it's hard to understand Emacs until you use Emacs, but Emacs really, it's, it's not an operating system because an operating system is going to be, you know, you have a kernel and the user land around the kernel and all, like we, we know what an operating system is and Emacs doesn't quite fit the definition of an operating system. Emacs has to run on top of an operating system, right? But Emacs is, it's a programming language, Emacs Lisp, it's an interpreter for their own programming language. Language. So Emacs is a programming language. It's the interpreter for the language. And because of that, it's an extensible platform that you can create Emacs programs. You can write things in Emacs Lisp and create these Emacs programs that run inside this Emacs environment. Uh, it's, it's really fascinating, right? It's like the most extensible platform you could possibly imagine. And because of that, we have thousands of these Emacs programs that you can install through various Emacs package managers that connect to various repositories of Emacs software. And well, you know, Emacs, when I say it's more than a text editor, it's an IDE. Like if you're a developer, obviously you'd love Emacs because it's going to have all your LSP stuff and you know uh, syntax highlighting, spell checking and everything. You know, it's just great, right? Like Emacs for a developer is just fantastic, but more than that, it's got so many other tools. It's got a built-in file manager called DeerEd. It's got a built-in web browser, EWW, the Emacs Web Wowser, which is a crazy name, but it's actually a web browser, like a graphical web browser if you're using the graphical version of Emacs, so it'll display images even, right? You've got org mode in Emacs, which is a game changer, and then, you know, uh, to do and task list kind of stuff like org agenda, which is fantastic. You've got your Git client, Maggot. Uh, like there's so much stuff. You can even have games inside of Emacs. They're like there are programs and uh, games that are written in Emacs list for running on Emacs. They're typically these old school like you know, 80s Atari style games. Like you, you get Pong and things like that. You know you can play inside Emacs Tetris. But one of the coolest features of Emacs that I don't think gets talked about enough and that really separates it from any other piece of software is the fact that everything you write in Emacs as far as Emacs Lisp code, anything that's part of an Emacs program you're creating, anything that you do with your Emacs config file, anything written in Emacs Lisp that's a part of Emacs is self-documenting, meaning every single time I write a function in my Emacs config, it's self-documented, meaning I can actually go get help information about that function I wrote, right? Or the key binding I set, or the variable I just assigned a value to. Like all of it self-documents itself, and it's just, it's fascinating. So when you ask the question, is Emacs a text editor or is it an operating system? It's probably closer to an operating system than a text editor. It just doesn't quite meet the classic definition of what an operating system is. Now, before I go, I need to thank a few special people. I need to thank the producers of this episode. And of course, I'm talking about these guys right here. Matt, Steve, 40 millimeter, Cap Caveman, Darloff, Lee, Jersey Killer, Mark, Methos, Erion, Paul, Peace Arch and Fedora, Realities for Less, Red Prophet, Roland, Morgento, and Ubuntu, and Willie. These guys, they're my highest tiered patrons over on Patreon. Without these guys, this episode of Hey DT would not have been possible. The show's also brought to you by each and every one of these fine ladies and gentlemen as well. All these names you're seeing on the screen right now, these are all my supporters over on Patreon because I don't have any corporate sponsors. I'm sponsored by you guys, the community. And if you like my work and want to see more videos about Linux and free open source software, subscribe to DistroTube over on Patreon. Peace, guys.